Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Planetarium Exploring Space, part of our MOS at Home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed captions button below and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, I'm unable to see any comments you post over there, um, but thank you so much for joining us anyway. We're so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. Let's meet our flight crew for today's journey through space. Hello, everybody. My name is Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm going to be your presenter today, which means I'm doing most of the talking, but I need a little help along the way. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I'm going to be your pilot, flying you to a few different places. And today we're talking about um, a project that has been in the works for a very long time at NASA. And this year, 2021, is supposedly the year it's finally going to launch. I am talking about the James Webb Space Telescope, also called JWST or just Webb. And I, this is the space telescope that is often touted as the successor to Hubble the premier space telescope of the last several decades. And I say supposedly because this telescope has a long history of missing its scheduled launch dates. This is a project that was originally conceived in 1996. At the time, they thought it would be able to launch in 2007. It has missed scheduled launch dates for 2012, for 2016, for 2017, for 2018, and for 2020. Hopefully it is supposedly actually going to launch on Halloween of this year, 2021. Um, but before I start talking about James Webb and why it's worth putting all this effort into it and why it is unprecedented as a space telescope, which is one of the reasons for all the delays, it's kind of hard to talk about Webb without first talking about the telescope that it gets touted as replacing. And I'm talking about Hubble. So Katie, can you take us into space and give us a look at the Hubble Space Telescope? So Hubble, as you may or may not know, is considered one of, if not the greatest revolution in astronomy within the last several decades. Um, it launched in 1990, also late, also over budget. So it's not like Webb is the first one to <laughs> follow that path. Uh, it has been upgraded several times over the years um, by visits from astronauts. So as you can see from this graphic, it's actually in low Earth orbit. It orbits at a height of right around 350 miles up. So it's not that high. It was within reach of the space shuttle. So five times over its history, it got visited by astronauts. Uh, who upgraded it. And it really has played an enormous role in modernizing our understanding of the universe. It's an incredible tool for us to have. Um, you can see, you can see it, sort of get a sense of its size here a little bit, just for a, a sense of scale. This thing's about 44 feet long. Um, the tube is about 14 feet wide. It's often compared in size to a school bus. So keep that in mind as you're looking at Hubble, this thing which has been um, the premier telescope for the, since 1990, we're hoping it can keep its ability to point accurately um, for another several years. It's probably going to have to be deorbited sometime between 2028 and 2040. But now let's compare it to Webb. So Katie, uh, can you go ahead and give us a sense of the size difference we're talking about here? So once again, here is a model of Hubble, about 44 feet long, 14 feet wide in the tube, um, comparable in size to a school bus. Now let's take a look at it next to Webb. The Webb telescope, as you will note, is way bigger. <laughs> um, at its longest dimension, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be almost 70 feet long. 
and almost 50 feet wide. So this thing is significantly larger than Hubble it, in just in many ways. Uh, and it's more often compared to the size of a tennis court. So you've got something about the size of a school, you know, compared to something the size of a school bus. That said, Webb is actually a lot lighter than Hubble. So the whole Webb telescope, even though it is about the size of a tennis court, weighs about as much as a school bus. So that is the whole telescope though. Now there's one part of the telescope that is more important than any other, and that is the mirror. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen to give you an idea of the difference in size of the mirrors. So this is what makes a telescope powerful or not, is the size of the primary mirror. Hubble's primary mirror is um, it's about, it's just under eight feet. It's about seven feet, 10 inches in diameter. You've got a human there for scale and it's ground out of a single piece of glass. And you may or may not be aware that when it launched, it did actually have a flaw in that mirror. One of the first servicing missions to Hubble uh, was to upgrade its optics to account for the flaw in the mirror and make it so that Hubble could be as powerful as it was designed to be. So that's about seven feet, 10 inches. Uh, the mirror on web is almost three times as wide. So it's about 21 feet across. And you can see it's not made out of a single solid piece of anything. It's actually made up of 18 interlocking hexagons. And they can't be made out of glass the way Hubble's is. 18 hexagons, a 21 foot long mirror ground out of glass would be way too heavy to launch. So they had to make them out of something really lightweight. These things are actually made out of beryllium, which is a very lightweight element. And they're coated in a thin, thin, thin layer of gold. It's actually, I think I heard the entire 21 foot mirror, the amount of gold that they used to cover the entire thing was about a golf ball's worth. And so, already you've got this telescope that is, you know, designed to be a lot more powerful because it has this huge, huge mirror. This is going to be the largest telescope mirror ever launched into space, at least so far. Each of those individual uh, fragments, by the way, each of those individual hexagons is nearly four and a half feet across. So, these are very different types of mirror. Now, can anybody think of a reason why we would do something like coating the mirror in gold? I want you to see if you can think of something. Uh, if you have an answer, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. If you don't have an answer, you don't know at all, you can always put question marks because one of the most important things about science is knowing what we don't know and being able to admit it. So think, take a moment, think of a reason why we might want to do something like coat the mirror in something like gold. Or remember, feel free to put question marks. We have a bunch of question marks and we have one answer from Roy wondering, maybe it's because it's inert. Mm. So the answer actually has to do with uh, one of the reasons why I actually personally have a problem with James Webb uh, being touted as it is so very often as the successor to Hubble. It actually has to do with what part of the electromagnetic spectrum the telescope is designed to look in. It turns out it's a completely different part of the spectrum than Hubble. So I'm going to show you, here is a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. You've probably heard of these different types of light, gamma rays, x-rays, microwave, radio, infrared, ultraviolet, visible. And when we design a telescope, telescopes are not, no telescope is designed to look in all parts of the spectrum. When we design a telescope, we design it to look in specific parts. And we do that because you learn different things about the universe by looking at things in different wavelengths. That's why it's very, very helpful to look at things in more than one wavelength. Oftentimes those very beautiful pictures of space you see um, are actually combinations of observations from multiple telescopes 
looking in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes, human eyes, have evolved to look at a relatively narrow part of the spectrum, which we call the visible part because it's the part we can see. And that's mostly what Hubble is designed to look in. Those are the wavelengths it sees best. It can also see a narrow range on either side of the visible spectrum. So it can see a little bit in the ultraviolet and it can see a little bit in the infrared. But mostly what it's looking at is the same part of the spectrum our eyeballs can see. Webb is designed to look in a completely different part of the spectrum. It's all about the infrared. You can see here, it's designed to be able to see best this giant chunk of the infrared part of the spectrum. It can see just a little bit into the visible. It does overlap with Hubble a little bit, but really Webb is designed to look in a completely different part of this electromagnetic spectrum. You can also see another telescope on here, the Spitzer Space Telescope. Uh, that is uh, another infrared telescope. It's no longer operating. It ran out of coolant because one of the things you need to do with an infrared telescope is keep it cool. And so Spitzer uh, was retired when it ran out of its coolant. And that's one of the reasons that Webb looks so different from Hubble. It's designed to look in a completely different part of light, a diff completely different type of light than Hubble is. Uh, so that's one of the reasons I hate hearing Webb called the successor to Hubble because it's actually not going to be looking at things the same way. And just to sort of give you an example, here are two images of one of my favorite things in space, the Horsehead Nebula. The one on the left is in infrared and the one on the right is invisible. You can see why you'd wanna look at them both because you see different types of detail in the two different types of light. Infrared is good at looking at cold things. Colder things glow in the infrared. So the dark cloud that you see in the visible one, the thing that looks like the horse head, that is cooler, that cloud is cooler than the glowing gas behind it. In the visible spectrum, that means that the, the cloud looks very, very dark and the glowing gas behind it is very, very bright. But in infrared, it's the colder gas that's glowing. And that means when you look in the infrared, you can see the structure of that gas cloud in a lot more detail, but you can't see the glow behind it very well. And so this is one of the reasons you wanna look in the infrared is if you wanna see detail about colder things. Now this includes a lot of things that we're very interested in. For instance, um, protoplanetary disks, the disks of around young stars that are going to become solar systems or even planets themselves. Planets tend to glow in the infrared. Uh, also things like dark gas clouds, um, things like brown dwarfs, which are these weird things that are somewhere between a star and a planet, they're sort of an in-between and they tend to glow very strongly in the infrared as well. These are all things that Hubble can't see all that well and James Webb is going to be great at seeing. So the reason it's actually coated in that gold is because gold is great at reflecting these particular wavelengths to the detector. So that's why it's covered in precious metal. Uh, another reason you want to look in the infrared is not just because you can see colder things, but you can also see older things. One of the things Webb is going to be able to do is see farther than Hubble can. And that has to do with what happens to light as the galaxy or the universe expands. So what we're looking at here is um, how far away, measured in something called redshift, different types of observatories have been able to see. So a redshift of one is you're looking at something about six, the way things were about six billion years ago, because the farther away you look, you're actually looking back in time. It has to do with the fact that light takes time to travel to you. So the higher the redshift, the older, the farther back you're looking. And during that time, the universe expands. That actually means that the light gets stretched out a little bit. So 
if you want to look at a galaxy very, very, very early in the history of the universe, the light that that galaxy emitted may have been in the visible, but over time, as it's traveled and as the universe has expanded, that light is now in the infrared, which means Hubble can't really see it that well, but James Webb can. So the big thing we really want to use James Webb to do is to look farther back in time towards the beginning of the universe than we've ever been able to do with any kind of telescope. There's also the fact that these wavelengths that Webb can see really, really well, we actually can't see here on the ground. There are certain wavelengths of infrared light that our atmosphere blocks. Ground-based observatories cannot see them. A lot of the wavelengths that Hubble can see can be seen by ground-based observatories. They're under an atmosphere, so they're never going to have quite as clear a view as Hubble does. But they can see a lot of the same types of light. But ground-based observatories are not going to be able to see a lot of the kinds of light that Webb will be able to see. If you want to see those wavelengths, you have to put a telescope in space. And it has to be a very, very big one. The bigger your telescope, the fainter the light you can see. And that light coming from the edge of the visible universe is very, very faint. Another reason we have to launch such a very large telescope in order to be able to see it. I'm going to pause there for a moment and move on, Janine. Are there any questions I should answer or should we just go ahead and keep plugging away? There was one observation that the horse head nebula looked a bit like an erupting volcano, but um, no question for you right now. I can see that. I love this nebula. I think it looks really, really cool. Both invisible and infrared. It looks cool both ways. So I keep saying, you know, we're launching a very large telescope. Usually when, I, when you talk about the size of a telescope, you're actually talking again about the size of the mirror. So the mirror, like I said, on web is about 21 feet, long, feet wide, in 21 feet in diameter. But when I was listing out the dimensions of web earlier, I said it was almost 70 feet long and almost 50 feet across. That's not the mirror. Those huge dimensions are coming from this thing underneath the mirror, this shield, which is quite expansive. This is the thing that makes Webb the size of a tennis court. And this is something that you don't see on Hubble. Hubble does not have this giant multi-layered shield uh, on one side of it. Now, can you think, go ahead and think, why, why does Webb need this? Why does Webb need this enormous shield in space? What about Webb would make such a giant shield? What do you think this shield does, basically? Once again, if you're not sure, go ahead and put in question marks. All right, we got some answers coming in, some question marks. Maybe it's to do with reflection. Maybe it's to do with helping it cool, um, blocking the sun to block stuff, collect solar energy, collect solar energy or heat dissipation, protect it. Um, it protects it from something because it needs energy. These are all excellent answers. And yes, you'll notice I keep calling it a shield. What I didn't want to tell you before I asked you that question was give you the uh, full name that we use for it. This is the sun shield. Uh, so those of you who were speculating that it somehow has to do with blocking the sun or keeping the telescope cool, you are 100% correct. Because remember, it's an infrared telescope. Infrared telescopes need to be kept cool. Something like Spitzer did that by having coolant within the telescope. But when the coolant ran out, we had to retire Spitzer because the telescope started to heat up. And when a telescope heats up, it starts glowing in the infrared. The telescope itself starts giving off infrared light. And then it's not much good as an infrared telescope. It's only good if you can keep it really cool. So we didn't want to go the coolant route the way we did with Spitzer. So with Webb, we went the sun shield route. This shield is actually 
designed to keep to the telescope is going to orient itself so that this shield is between the mirror and the detectors and the light from the sun. And by doing that, it's going to keep the mirror very, very, very cold. It's going to keep the detectors very, very cold. The hot side is going to be pretty hot. You can see here, it's going to get up to 185 degrees Celsius. That would just totally make the telescope useless as an infrared telescope if that level of heat made it to the detectors in the mirror. So this shield is critical. That is also the side that the solar panel is going to be on. So it is going to be getting energy from the sun, um, even as it's trying to dissipate that heat and energy to keep the telescope cool. It's going to absorb some of it through the solar panel in order to power the telescope. And this is why it needs multiple layers. One layer would not do the job. It needs multiple layers in order to be able to dissipate that heat. One layer cannot just reflect all the heat away. It's going to absorb some of it. And that's why you need the multiple layers. So this is why Webb is so huge because it needs this massive five layer sun shield in order to be able to function without a huge supply of coolant which again, we didn't want to do because that's what meant we had to retire Spitzer, even though it was churning out so much awesome science. Once it's out of coolant, it's done. So here's another question. I mentioned several times the size of this telescope, 21 foot mirror, 70 by 50 foot sun shield, size of a tennis court. There is no rocket that can carry something that big into space. How are we going to launch Webb? No rocket can carry a 70 foot by 50 foot object into space. No rocket on earth. So how are we going to get Webb into space? Go ahead and if you have any guesses, put them in the Q&A. As always, you can put a question mark. We have a couple answers coming in. Um, lots of question marks. Also, fold it up. It will go up in pieces, rockets. Uh, it will unfold. It will be carried in pieces and then assembled. Um, maybe the people on the space station are going to assemble it. Uh, Azora, who's nine, thinks it launches itself. Um, and so another person says maybe you pull it behind a rocket. So there's a, two main ways you can get something this big into space. You can either, like many of you said, assemble it in space. That's how we built the space station. The space station is way too big to have launched. We built it in pieces over the course of many rocket launches. Your other option is you launch it in one piece, but it's all folded up like origami. And that's what we're doing with Webb. Webb is actually launching into space tightly folded up. This is a drawing of what it's going to look like in its folded up form inside the payload bay of an Ariane 5 rocket, which is a European Space Agency rocket, because this mission is a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency. So the ESA is providing the rocket. And you can see it's folded up real tight all folded up. And here is an actual photo of the mirror in its folded up position, ready to, um, in this configuration, it would be ready to go into the rocket. It's not at this point attached to the sun shield, which you can see that mess below it. So it's finally getting ready to go into the rocket after many years of delays. Uh, and then once it's in, once it's launched, it gets deployed, but it's still all folded up and it's useless in its folded up position. It needs to unfurl itself. And that whole process is pretty awesome as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that Katie can show us what it looks like when the web begins to unfold itself. So this is it in its folded up form. This is gonna happen over the course of a week, very slowly. First, the solar panel unfurls. And then, the sun shield frame starts to unfold. 
So there's that huge sun shield. First, the whole thing unfurls, like it makes itself into that kite shape. And then the layers start to separate because remember there's five layers to this shield. So once the sun shield is in place, that's when you can start to think about unfurling the mirror, which has multiple parts to it. I talked a lot about the primary mirror, but there's also the secondary mirror, which is unfolding right now, which helps bounce light back into the detectors. And then the two folded up sides of the primary mirror can lock into place. Like I said, this is gonna happen over the course of a week after web launches. And it's going to do that as it's on its way to its final home. Remember when we were looking at Hubble, it was very close to Earth at a height of about 350 miles up. Webb is going to be in a very different place. Because remember, planets radiate infrared light. That means Earth is actually giving off a lot of infrared radiation. The moon also gives off a lot of infrared radiation. So for this telescope to function at its best, it actually needs to be farther away from the Earth and the moon. And it's going to be four times as far away from the Earth as the moon, almost a million miles away. This is how far it's going to be when it ultimately finishes unfolding and is ready to start its mission. Now that of course means that unlike Hubble, Webb cannot be fixed or upgraded in space. It's way too far away. We've never sent humans anywhere near this far yet. But that means everything has to go right. So this is why there's been so many launch delays. They're building an unprecedented telescope that has to go work perfectly the first time with this crazy unfurling process. And it's, most of what's led to all those many launch delays. But this is the year, it's finally gonna launch, 2021. I've got a good feeling about this. Now I've talked a lot. I wanna take a few minutes for questions if there are any, Janine. Yeah, we do have two questions. One is, um, Mark is wondering if the needing to fold up is why the mirror is made up of the hexagonal panels. That is, in fact, one of the reasons it's made up. First, it would have been too heavy to launch one solid piece, um, but it does also make it possible for the mirror to fold up like that and fit into the rocket. So that was a major plus on two fronts. And then we have a question from Catherine who's wondering, um, how come the satellite won't burn up as it's unfolding? It won't burn up because it's actually moving away from the Earth. So when you see things, um, burn up in the atmosphere, that's actually when they're falling through Earth's atmosphere. It's actually friction from the air rubbing against them as they move very quickly through Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and that is not going to be the case here. When um, Webb is unfurling, it's actually moving farther and farther and farther away from the atmosphere. So away from anything that would cause it to burn up. So we don't have to, we don't, we're pretty sure we don't have to worry about web burning up. It's other things that we're worried, like what if the sun shield doesn't unfold or what if the mirror gets stuck? These are the things that they are testing over and over and over and over again to make sure that they work. All right, and we have one last question from Katya. Um, is how long do we expect the telescope to last? That's a bit of an open question. Um, we expect a pretty long life out of this telescope, maybe not as long as Hubble. Hubble has been now functioning um, for over 30 years, which is longer than anybody expected it to. And that's partly because it was able to get upgraded. And one of the things that was able to get upgraded are the things, are the wheels inside that help it point very precisely. We're not going to be able to upgrade those on web. So the ones it launches with are the ones it's stuck with. And when those fail, the telescope can't point anymore. So it's really a question of how long things like that are going to last. Now, hopefully we're looking at 15, 20 good years out of this telescope, but we'll see, no guarantees. But what's really exciting is there is going to be this period of time where Hubble and Webb are both in space at the same time, both observing so they can uh, observe in tandem. Yeah, it's so cool to get to see those multi-wavelength images of all different things like that when you showed earlier. I do think that's all the questions we have time for, though. So if uh, Katie and Talia, you guys want to say goodbye. Bye, everybody.
All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you uh, enjoyed learning some about JWST and um, Hubble as well and kind of how those work. Uh, I'm sorry, we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we do do try to do some uh, space shows uh, about twice a week. So keep an eye out for those. You can see our listings on uh, www.mos.org slash MOS at home or follow us on our social media channels. If you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome. And thank you to everyone who already has. Uh, and if you were interested in knowing what programs Katie was using, she used both NASA's Eyes and Worldwide Telescope, which can be found at eyes.nasa.gov and www.worldwidetelescope.org. Uh, thank you again for joining us and we hope we'll see you again soon.